thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Fayaz, as uh, Doris has already introduced me. I would be talking about how we can stop CRISPR, actually, with machine learning. So that's the title of the talk. And uh, before moving on, I wasn't sure whether I would be able to show my face during the presentation, so I put a picture of myself in my native environment outside the Department of Computer Science. So this is me. I am uh, part of the Tissue Image Analytics Lab, which is led by Nasser Rajput, who's hiding back over there. There are a bunch of 30-odd individuals. Uh, some of them are also engaged in the Path Lake project, which stands for Pathology Image Data Lake for Analytics, Knowledge, and Education, where our main objective is uh, try to make sense of digital pathology and computational pathology data and trying to infer novel insights from that data. My expertise and training has been in the development of bespoke machine learning and data science models. Now, what does that mean? That means build machine learning models that don't work for any other problem than the one particular problem they have been designed to solve. So that's uh, especially in the field of computational biology and pathology. So that's my area of expertise. I've been previously affiliated with the Pakistan Institute of Engineering and Applied Sciences and the Colorado State University, where I was a Fulbright Fellow for my PhD. So with that, I'd like to move on to, since I wasn't, uh, I'm not sure the breadth of uh, the audience, I have included some introductory slides on what exactly is machine learning. So let's say we've got two sets of uh, pictures uh, or paintings. One in the top row, those have been painted by Wong Go, and the other one in the bottom row, those have been painted by Salvador Dali. If I show you these, uh, these beautiful paintings, and then I ask you the question, who painted this? But if I ask the computer who painted this, this would be relatively straightforward to answer because uh, this particular painting was already part of what we call our training set. So we can all uh, very easily say that this was painted by Wong Go. The interesting bit is uh, what happens if I show you this picture? Now, this is not a part of our training set. The images that I showed you on the previous uh, a couple of slides ago. And uh, if the computer, if you can program a computer to learn from the given patterns in these pictures, which we call training examples, and is able to infer who painted this, then this is what machine learning does. So we are essentially training the machine learning model to generalize, as we call it, uh, to generate predictions for unseen cases, for cases that it has not previously seen. And humans are able to do it, doing the same thing in computer, in a computer is called, is called machine learning. So that's why my area of expertise is, and uh, depending upon who you ask, what exactly is machine learning, you will get with, you, you land up with different answers, as I've tried to show the, in this in this diagram on, the, on, on your screens. So essentially, if the simplest definition of machine learning is learning from data. If you have patterns, if you have a set of examples for which you know the labels, then what we can do is design machine learning models that can predict for previously unseen cases. And uh, it has been a very upcoming technology, especially with the advent of deep learning. And recently there has been a big scientific breakthrough uh, by Google actually, so uh, on, on solving protein structures using the same technology or similar technologies that have been used previously in solving the game of Go. So uh, that, that's a huge step forward for science. Uh, if you ever try to solve protein structures, everyone knows uh, how difficult that can, can, this can be a very useful step. There, there are a large number of applications ranging from uh, my uh, hobby work on how we can design a machine learning based strategy that allows a cat to escape from a mouse, it's available on my web page, or how we can use the similar technologies of image analysis to predict how what, what is the intensity of wind speeds in a hurricane based on satellite imagery data? So with that background, I would like to present some of my previous research in the field of uh, bioinformatics uh, that uses machine learning. So my uh, primary area of interest had been, during my PhD, had been about designing machine learning methods that can predict protein interactions and their interfaces using machine learning. So instead of paintings, we take pictures of proteins or CG structures of proteins and how they fit together. And then we use these machine learning methods to generate predictions for novel protein complexes. So we developed uh, machine learning tools uh, for predicting these interactions and interfaces. And uh, some of them offer state of the art performance uh, in, in, for, for these cases. 
So we have a, a method called CAMELS that is state of the art for predicting protein interactions and interfaces for a protein uh, that is called CAModulin. And uh, we have another method called FairPred that allows us to predict protein structures for generic or other proteins as well. And we've tested these uh, on a bunch of problems in the wet lab. So we generated predictions about these protein complexes and their interfaces in the wet lab or proteins that are in, involved in the infection of cotton the cotton leaf curl virus, which is a big problem in Pakistan. So what we found is uh, we used these, these machine learning based tools and we predicted what are the pro in protein interaction partners of uh, the cotton leaf curl virus with cotton and what exactly is the part of the protein that is involved in these interactions. And those were validated by my collaborator in the wet lab and found to be, and those predictions were found to be correct. So that is one of the things. Similarly, I've, I've also worked uh, on the development of uh, protein function-based predictors using machine learning. So whether a protein will form amyloids, those are uh, or, or prions, those are proteins that clump together and can are implicated in a, in a number of diseases, uh, including the mad cow disease. So we, what we did is we took a data set of known prions and amyloids and tried to predict whether a new protein is expected to form prions or not, and if, if so, what part of the protein is implicated in the formation of that particular prion. Uh, similarly, we've done some work on the development of antimicrobial peptides. Uh, we have a machine learning method that if you give it a protein, a small protein sequence, then it can predict whether this protein sequence will be effective against a particular species of uh, bacteria. So that is, uh, I'm looking for some collaborators in that area. If uh, there's anyone, please get in touch with me. We also have a method that predicts hemolytic activity of peptides for a given peptide, whether that will be that will be lethal to red blood cells or not. So th that is for the sort of background. Uh, before, now I'd like to change gears and uh, move to the CRISPR work. So. On the screen, you see uh, the picture of Dr. J Jennifer Dudna uh, when she heard the news about her Nobel Prize for the discovery of CRISPR. And just like every other being on uh, living being on this earth, uh, even Nobel laureates are composed of cells which have chromosomes, which have genes. And if we can edit those genes, if we can change the sequence of those genes, then essentially what happens is that we change the proteins that carry out different functions and then we can get different behaviors from the from that organism. Or we can also use the same technology to uh, to cure disease and, and act as a therapy agent for different types of cancers, let's say. And it has been successfully dem demonstrated in human cells recently as well that CRISPR is able to edit uh, cells that can uh, cure or uh, can, can reduce the impact of uh, certain so with that background, where did this discovery come from? Um, essentially, it's, it's the same story of what we see in Tom and Jerry, that a cat is afraid of a mouse. It all goes all the way. Uh, well, in that case, a cat is afraid of a mouse, but in, in reality, a mouse is typically afraid of a cat. And, and it goes all the way down to bacteria, which are afraid of certain viruses, which we call phages. And uh, those bacteria are able to infect these viruses, and those, uh, those viruses replicate these bacteria which essentially kill it and uh, uh, but after the generation of a large number of viruses. So this has been, this had been known. However, uh, what was discovered uh, in the 90s is that there are certain defense mechanisms that the bacteria have as well against these phages or these viruses. So once a, a virus infects a particular bacteria, it injects its DNA, but if a, uh, if a bacteria has a CRISPR array in it, then uh, what that does is that it, support, it, it stores a chunk of that virus's DNA as part of its own DNA just to remember that it had been infected by that. And then it also has certain other mm, protein mechanisms which are called uh, CRISPR-associated proteins or CAS proteins. What those do is that when the next time that particular cell or species is infected by, by, by the same virus, then what happens is that those proteins come into action and chop the literally chop the uh, viral DNA up into pieces, so it can cut the DNA. And what Dr. Doudna and Dr. Emmanuel Charpentier, who won this year's Nobel Prize for their uh, discovery uh, for their work on CRISPR, what they did is they adapted the same mechanism to allow very precise targeted uh, gene editing. So 
and, and that, can be, can, that can be done in living cells. So if we want to change the DNA of a living cell, uh, then CRISPR technology allows for that. And the way they did it is taking inspiration from the basic biological discovery of, uh, of how CRISPR works in, in bacteria, and then they modified that to do precise editing. So what, what this allows you to do is that if you give me a copy of the, if you give me a, a piece of target DNA where you want to make a cut, then a CRISPR-Cas9 system designed by these Nobel laureates, what it allows you to do is to precisely cut at that location, and then you can inject a new copy of the DNA there, or you can modify the DNA, and it has, it has really revolutionized uh, biology. It, I give an example of this is what uh, deep learning is to machine learning people. This is what CRISPR has done to the field of biology. It has been used in, in, in the development of cancer therapeutics. It has recently been used to identify what genes are important for survival of uh, coronavirus patients. Which is a pretty upcoming uh, technology. It has also been used to generate uh, designer babies in China that I will not be talking about too much in this talk. But uh, there are some problems with CRISPR as well. It's not a perfect technology. Sometimes it makes errors by editing a part of the DNA where it shouldn't have, have made an edit. And the longer the CRISPR system stays within a cell, the, the larger the chances that it would make an edit where we don't want to make, make an edit. So you can think of it is that what we need for CRISPR is a, is a breaking mechanism. So I take an analogy from nuclear physics. If a reactor is going, Haywire, then what we want to do is that we want to stop it. So the way we can do that, or the way it was done, the first reactor anyways, was that there was a person called Scram, or a safety control rod axe man, who would use an axe, physical axe, to cut a rope that would then drop a control rod into the reactor, just sequestering all the neutrons in the reactor and putting the reaction to a stop. This is something that we, we need for, for CRISPR as well. So we can stop the gene editing once we, are, we have had the desired result. This is what is called anti-CRISPR design, so stopping CRISPR when we want it to stop. And uh, the phages, actually, they, they have, uh, it was discovered that they have certain proteins that can stop CRISPR. And more interestingly, there were also some proteins that were, uh, there was a certain bacteria that were discovered to have a part of their DNA as part of their CRISPR array. So in theory, these bacteria should not exist because they should be they should cut their own DNA just like CRISPR cuts. So if there's a part of the CRISPR array that's also part of the DNA, these bacteria are called self-targeting, just like a dog eating its own tail, and they should be able to uh, able to cut itself. But because they survive, that means they must have a at least have some form of mechanism or a protein, let's say, that allows them to survive. So they must have anti-CRISPR proteins. So that is the hypothesis I came up with. And then I searched the literature and found that some people have reported that there are uh, quite a number of bacterial species that have these, uh, these anti-CRISPR proteins. So the hypothesis was that if a bacterial genome is self-targeting, then there must be at least one antimicrobial, uh, anti-CRISPR protein in them. And if we can get a bunch of these, then we can use them as examples, just like the paintings that I showed you, and then we can find new anti-CRISPR protein. So I quickly wrote an email to Dr. Dudna, who I didn't know, and she kindly responded, and we, we put together a data set, together with her postdocs and some of my students, uh, that, uh, that allowed us to do th uh, this sort of uh, experiment in machine learning. So we collected about uh, 432 known anti-CRISPR proteins, but most of them were very similar to each other, and we weren't interested in finding something uh, very similar to what we already knew. So what we did is we used very stringent uh, sequence identity threshold uh, that that gave us a very dis uh, you can say a very unique or a disjoint type of uh, or non redundant data set of these proteins and then we trained a machine learning method a bespoke machine learning model based on XGBoost uh, that allowed us to essentially do the same thing that you would do uh, when you want to do Google search so. When you do a Google search, you want the target results to skim on top of all the results that you have. So what we designed is a machine learning model that if you give it a give it a give it a query protein or give it a proteome, then those proteins that have the potential of acting as anti-CRISPR should skim to the top. So this is what 
the machine learning model does. Or similarly, when you want to watch Netflix, you ideally want all the all your interests on the on the very first page. Actually, it's a very similar technology that is used in those recommendation systems as well. We use the same thing, and uh, we did very stringent cross validation as well. We used a data set of existing proteins, and we did a cross validation on those. And while we were working on this project, there were some newly discovered anti-CRISPRs that were not included in, in the training. And what we found that is that the machine learning model is not perfect. It works one third of the time, but once it works, it discovers if you have if you give it ten proteins, uh, ten proteins, then it's able to find, identify correctly one third of the time, uh, at least uh, three times. Uh, three out of the, those ten would be novel anti-CRISPR proteins that are very dissimilar to anything that we had known before. So it, it, we knew that it didn't work perfectly. So, but what it allowed us to do is to reduce the number of experiments that would have been required in the wet lab. And we identified what exactly in the, in, we used machine learning also to identify what were the common patterns which weren't known in different anti-CRISPR proteins, or what make them anti-CRISPRs actually, what, is, what part of this protein is involved in the anti-CRISPR protein and, and what exactly makes it anti-CRISPR. And what we found is that the existence of, of proline is, is negatively correlated with it being a, an anti-CRISPR protein and so on. And that was pretty useful for us. And then what we did is we identified a set of 10 uh, candidate anti-CRISPR proteins together with Dr. Dudna's lab. And we tested them first using the machine learning model. And we identified that three of those uh, had very high chances of being uh, anti-CRISPR proteins, which were later tested in the wet lab by her team and verified that these proteins can actually sequester CRISPR and stop its action in certain species. And the good thing is uh, that uh, one of these proteins is very small as well. So we have recently filed a patent for it. It's, uh, the award of the patent is still pending. The code for the discovery of this, uh, that led to the discovery of these anti-CRISPR proteins is available online at these uh, locations. So you are welcome to try it out yourself if you want. And there's also a web server available for that. So if you're looking for new anti-CRISPR protein industry, you just need to give it your protein sequence and you'll identify whether that particular, there's a protein in that that can act as an anti-CRISPR or not. This work was published in uh, nucleic acid research. I'm, um, I sh must mention the names of all the students who did a lot of hard work in this. Uh, and uh, there was a student in Dr. Dudna's lab who did all the wet lab experiments, uh, Simon. And uh, then the machine learning part was done by my PhD student, uh, Amina. There was also significant contribution from uh, uh, our postdoc, Kyle, uh, Kyle Waters. And uh, that's the story of how you can stop CRISPR uh, with machine learning. After that, we have also uh, developed, in collaboration with other researchers, put together the largest known database of anti-CRISPR proteins. So if you want to take a look at that, uh, the link to that paper or the title of that paper is over here. If you, if you have a budding interest in this uh, technology, I would definitely recommend Dr. Dudner's own book, which is an excellent read. I was actually reading that book uh, when this idea uh, started developing in my head. And uh, the title of the book is A Tracking Creation. It's a really wonderful book, and I welcome you to try it. And I greatly thank all the participants for this particular session, as well as the organizers.